hand to order. Shall we take the uh, roll call? I will. Um, let me. Yeah, let me grab my roll call list real quick. Sorry about that. It's a request. From... Well, no, Patty has my list. So I'll just take attendance. Okay. Folks who are here. Okay. And then we can do the. We'll do the official roll call. Okay. Lisa's okay. on the phone, if that matters. Okay. Hi, Lisa. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to turn this over to Leah Tuckman and um, ask you to conduct the meeting for us. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, lots happened since I saw you all last, and I'm going to take just a few minutes to update you on some different pieces that we have in motion. And then the bulk of this session will be listening. I just want to listen to some of your thoughts. Um, we've got four, you know, precise questions to ask you, but of course, uh, we can go off script a little bit as well if there are other things you'd like to add, um, because this is about what you really, what, you, what your hopes and dreams are for the for the young people of Portsmouth School District. So, um, let's get started. Quick sort of agenda overview and agreements. As I said, I'm going to give just a couple minutes of an overview of what we've done thus far. And then the bulk of our time today is going to be around these four focus questions before we close up. And I promise you, this will be done by 7 o'clock. That's a guarantee. Um, these are the agreements that I've been using in all of the focus groups, and I intend to use them in the ones moving forward as well. I've highlighted two that I think are particularly important as we dig into these four questions together. Um, one is speaking our truths. Um, this can be really hard to do, especially when it's recorded and it feels like it's a very public event, but it's really important that you're honest here. Um, it's really not going to help us think about strategic planning unless we've got a clear view of what you want, what students want, what teachers want, and what community members want. The other item that I've um, underlined here is around confidentiality. Um, and although this is being recorded, when we aggregate the data, when we put it all together, we aren't associating names with it. We're going to have hundreds of respondents in focus groups like these, hopefully thousands of survey respondents. Um, and so there aren't going to be names attached to it, and we will sort of be maintaining confidentiality as we aggregate the data and think about trends and themes. Can we all agree to these um, for today? Yeah. Beautiful. So quick overview, um, I, uh, I think I showed you this graphic before, but the bottom line is um, this really isn't an informing type of uh, project or initiative that we're digging into today. This is more of a deciding together. Um, this is not necessarily superintendent or principal directed, but rather you know community uh, surfaced and really thinking about how we can reach every member of the community when we start thinking about this process together. Um, I really like this graphic. Uh, we made this graphic specifically for the portrait because we think about all these different community members that play a big role in um, Portsmouth School District. And so you see school committee at the bottom. You obviously play a huge role in all this, but there are a ton of other people um, and roles we're going to hopefully be sending out surveys, not just to current students, but alumni as well. That feels really important. Um, we're going to be going to Wamsit tomorrow for our first community event and at the rec center, really meeting with families and breaking bread with them. And um, we're really hoping to reach every sort of every community member in this process. So how are we deciding together? Obviously, there's the focus groups and then there are the surveys to collect all of the data. Um, but the committee is really going to be the crew that synthesizes the data. Um, Zach's on the committee, Carrie's on the committee. We've got parents and caregivers on the committee. We have a student on the committee, which I'm really excited about. And so that's the, that's the group that's really going to be synthesizing all of the survey and focus group data and coming up with a draft. Um, but public comment does not end there. Once the draft is created, we're going to send it back out for feedback. Um, so community members, partners, school committee, everyone who wants to give feedback on the first draft or the second draft can. Um, and it's an iterative process that will be going back and forth again and again to make sure we get it right. 
You've seen this graphic. Um, we are right on, tar on target with timing. Um, the committee was a little frustrated with me because maybe I was moving a bit too fast, but I'm really dedicated to staying on this timeline, um, and we are in really good shape. So April, May, and June is all about collecting data, as we've mentioned, um, so that we can really start drafting. Hopefully we'll have a draft, honestly, in June. Um, our next committee meeting is June 6th, <coughs> where we're going to be taking all of that information, all of that data, um, and starting to bucket it and theme it. This is my spreadsheet that most people don't like, but I did want to show you progress. And if I clicked on it, um, which I don't want to do because I'm sure I'll lose this PowerPoint, but it, you can see all of the green over here. Let me click on it, it's hard to see. Um, you can see all of the green where we're starting to actually make some progress here. Um, And we're getting there, right? We're we're almost we're almost at the point where we can start putting together a draft. But you know, if you want to click on this, you have this in the PowerPoint that I shared last time as well. It's a live document, so we keep adding to it. It also includes all of the committee meeting agendas. So these are hyperlinks. This was our first committee meeting agenda. The second one's here, and I've already started um, drafting the third meeting agenda. So really, if you're curious, you should feel free to click on any of these. Um, to get a better sense of what happens in those committee meetings, the POG committee meetings. So before we start with the focus questions, I just wanted to pause. I know that was really fast, but I am dedicating most of this time to hearing from you. Are there any questions at all about our timeline, about the process? No questions? Okay. Um, I've already been to Lister Academy and New Franklin Elementary, um, and we have a bunch coming up tomorrow and Friday. So the focus groups are ongoing, um, and it's just been really nice to hear from some of your students and some of your staff. It's I would really love to hear from the recent graduates. Do we have any of those? Yeah. I'm happy to organize. In terms of how did they feel prepared for Right, so I would say one thing we can do, and I recommend doing this, is reaching out to guidance counselors at the high school and getting a list of email addresses for maybe, I don't know, 10 to 15 alumni. And we can either do a focus group that's specific to alumni, or we can just make, make sure they fill out the survey. And the survey is gonna have an opportunity for people to click what role they are in. So whether current student, alumni, staff, community members, school committee member, and so we can see precisely what the alumni are saying. But I, we just had a, my, my high school reunion, and most of us felt we were very well prepared uh, right. for, for college and, and to work beyond. Beautiful. So, so Zach, if you could just make a note of that so we can remember to reach out to guidance counselors um, and get a list of email addresses. We did that in, our, that in the last. Helpful the last city that That's what we think is not necessarily with the, their experience. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's a critical group to hear from. It might be good to do, uh, to look maybe a little further just with COVID and the pandemic. Yeah, and, true. Uh, there's just a very different experience in the last few years. So, um, you know, just that might be helpful as well. So not just recent alumni. Yeah. Or maybe defining recent as the last five years or something like that, you know. Great. I think that's a good point. That makes a lot of sense. We can absolutely do that. It's a great suggestion. Any other questions, comments, suggestions before we jump in? Shall we raise hands when we do this, when we answer the questions, or do you want to go around the table, or what's the so best way I to do it? So I typically go around the table. Um, the reason we do a round robin is because um, we just want to make sure we hear from everybody. If you're not quite ready to share the first time around, we can come back to you. Um, but I do think it's really important to get everybody an opportunity to share. So we will do a round robin. You didn't send these questions out beforehand. I've been looking at my email trying to find oh, them. And they, yes, were, we they were in the um, superintendent. We should have highlighted it more. Yeah, right. really I, I had, yeah, I actually just found them this afternoon. So <coughs> I have my first had a chance to top of the head thought <laughs> answer here. Um, okay, so how about we, we come to you last? 
That'd be great. That, okay. <laughs> that feels like a good solution. Yeah. Um, or at least a Band-Aid, maybe. Um, okay, so let's jump in. Um, do you mind starting on this side? Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. My, should you want me to list all the things I came up with, or you want one Yeah, idea? well, I think before we jump in, I would say, um, you know, we obviously want to know what your thoughts are around what, what you wish and what you hope for the young people of Portsmouth to be, to know, and to do. Um, and I would think beyond just, like, and this, I, I don't expect to hear this from you, but sometimes when we do student focus groups, we often hear things like, I want to be a doctor. Um, we're, looking, we're looking for that, but we're also looking to dig a bit deeper into some of those soft skills as well. So if you can just make sure that you're giving a well-rounded answer, it's not just like, we want doctors and lawyers. Not that you would do that, but oftentimes when we do this with students, we get answers like that and we try to dig a little bit deeper. So, sure. Um, in no order of preference, I wrote kind, um, ability to problem solve, resourceful, resilient, community-minded, understand that they are part of a whole, be able to advocate for self and others, have a strong sense of self-awareness as well as social awareness, no appropriate use of technology, be able to speak another language, mm. and be able to lean into challenge. I love that list. Thank you. Um, mine are very, um, in, uh, they're in different sort of like sections, but I'll just sort of read them off, I guess. Um, uh, and also quite abstract, I think. Um, I feel to have a sense of belonging um, and a respect for their peers in the greater community, um, as well as be respected by, or feel respected by their peers. Um, let's see, an appreciation for other cultures and communities and people different from themselves. To be thinkers and creators and explorers. Be curious and mindful of their place in the world. Um, and, um, I think the rest of them fit better into number two, so I'll hold off on the rest. Thank you. I would say um, definitely leaning into opportunity and just, um, as Margaret said, and also the belonging and uh, mutual respect, feeling respect from the community and being respectful within the community. Um, I think also, I think the main one I would add would be like self-directed learner that they can problem solve and um, yeah, go from there. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. I, I would say that uh, uh, I'd like them to be able to be team. I, I thought you were finished. Hmm? Go ahead. You're finished. I, oh, no. You're, uh, you? to, to be team players. Uh, Wow. on many occasions. Uh, problem solvers, the uh, feeling of belonging is important. Uh, to be able to read, uh, comprehending, uh, be critical thinkers. And I think they cover the rest. To be able to do cursive. <laughs> <laughs> Strike that from Wait the record. Wait a second. Strike that from the record. That was a joke. Nancy's <laughs> just, just <laughs> causing <laughs> fights. <laughs> Let's circle back to Nancy. <laughs> Do you want to just add oh, one sure. or say? Sure. I think, because I, I want to, in our planning meetings, we talked about, like, you know, the focus on reading, math, you know, like the general skills. But I think um, eliminating, like, the reading with comprehension is really important. And I don't think that kind of came up, right? The critical thinking within it. Yep. Okay. I have. Um, I would like our students to be responsible, law-abiding citizens, um, <laughs> respectful of all aspects of our society, um, um, to be productive in their years after high school, to be good communicators, to be honest, and I would like them to be. Ex well, this probably isn't in the right category, but exposed to all kinds of opportunities for the future. <clears throat> mm. um, so that's what I have. That's great, thank you. My Liz, turn? your turn. Um, 
so I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with a lot that has been said, but I, I do think it's imperative, you know, in the work that I've done um, with kids of, you know, from, you know, kindergarten all the way up, as well as kids that have varying different s skills, that children have basic life skills, mm -hmm. um, such as communicating with others mm -hmm. um, and really having that focus of being able to to, to to have basic communication skills back and forth and whatnot, I think that's like first and foremost. Do kids need to know how to balance a checkbook anymore? I don't think so. But like, I think other skills like that, like basic, um, you know, if you're living on your own, this is what it might look like type of skills. Um, transferable skills. Yeah, I mean, but not just transferable skills, but like literally, once you leave high school and you're living on your own, whether it's in college or somewhere else, like, you know. What does it look like when you're paying rent and bills and what are these all, like so not so much transferable skills but like when you are no longer under your parents roof or or your Personal foster family's finance. roof that what does this look like because i think a lot of kids they, they, they you know they end up in the system or some other uh, something else happens or they end up on the streets and they don't you know they don't, they don't understand the reality of what does it take to get by um also like a, a focus on mental health I, I, and so just, I think, you know, I was sort of coming back to, like, what did I have when I was a kid at Portsmouth and what did I value the most? And I think it's what everybody said about community and belonging and being a team player. And then I like how what Pip said too, and, you know, being mindful of the place in the world and, and being cultured, because I do feel like a lot of people leave Portsmouth. I left Portsmouth myself um, and went to North Carolina. It was a whole different ball game. And I think that a lot of kids miss that when they live in Portsmouth, they're just, they're sort of stuck here and then they go in other parts of the, in the country or the world or, or even down to Boston and it's very different and there's a lot of kids that don't get that opportunity um, but I you know I want I would want kids to have a, a bigger idea of where they stand in the world the ability to problem solve um, and I think that's that's the gist of it. Can I ask? Please circle yes. back. Oh, hi. Sorry hey. I'm late. Um, Thanks for coming. Really Thanks here. for making it, Lisa. That was so, great. <laughs> a little rough on the road. Um, I agree with so much of what others have already said, and I don't want to repeat any of that. So I'm just looking a couple of things that I thought would be important that I didn't hear. Um, I think sort of like flexible and capable of change is one mm, thing yeah. that I'd like to see. Um, I'd like our kids to be healthy risk takers, like unafraid to try things, to fail, to take risks in their studies, in their lives. Um, I'd like to see people who are open-minded and have a solid amount of self-awareness. Um, and I think most of the other things people have said, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I um, managed to skip a line in mine, so could I just oh, add those? Please do. <laughs> okay. Um, and are there, uh, Liz is, what Liz said really reminded me of these things. Um, I had, actually they were the first things I wrote, which was well-adjusted, secure, safe, challenged, um, independent, with a sense of confidence, and to feel supported. Great. I'm going to move us along to the second question just to make sure we're, we can close by 7 o'clock. Can I ask one quick follow-up? Please do. Liz, when you were talking about kind of going other places, um, I think part of what you're talking about was like a skill of like building community or I just wanted to clarify that because that's, it's not just feeling included here, but knowing. Like that you're, yeah, that this is like only knowing a microcosm to... of the bigger universe in the world in the okay. sense that like, you know, Portsmouth is not the, the reality when you go to a different city a different area and I don't know you know I think with the next question we'll sort of answer how do you get to that point right. but I think that like I would have friends that would go to New York and they're like you're not cultured because you know you've just been in Portsmouth your whole life and it's like yeah kind of you know like if you don't get out and go, <laughs> and go other places then you don't really know and you're kind of in so I think you know so but I think it's like how do you deal with other people and other cultures and other areas and whatnot and I don't know that Portsmouth necessarily because of the microcosm that Portsmouth is, I don't think people necessarily get those experiences here, and then they may be, you know, thrown for a loop when they're in college or somewhere else, and they're dealing with people that have different backgrounds and whatnot. And so I think it, 
I somehow think conveying that. I would that call that a world view. Yeah, right? we're, yeah like, there's a sense yeah. of self place yeah. in the larger yeah. and an awareness that this isn't the only reality. <laughs> yep. Or a reality. <laughs> this isn't a reality. <laughs> yeah. We are not in a reality. Yeah. <laughs> so let's jump to question two. Um, we've just listed a bunch of characteristics, qualities, goals that we have. Um, and now we really want to think about what skills and experiences, even tools, do you think are needed to achieve these characteristics, <coughs> qualities, and goals? Um, we started on this side. Would that be okay? You can always skip, and we can come back to you. Um, I'm going to skip and collect my thoughts for a minute because I had totally notes fine. And I can't yep, find them. we'll come back. Um, <clears throat> I wrote. The need for creative assignments, for which you can't Google the answer. <laughs> Service learning, project-based learning, K through 12. Um, thoughtful and intentional group work with in independent work baked in. A solid social, uh, SEL curriculum, K through 12, to develop self and social awareness. <clears throat> People will think this is strange, but I, I think a solid understanding and ability to apply the scientific method is the key to problem solving. Doesn't matter whether it's in a science experiment, and it can start as early as kindergarten, and it allows you to answer questions you have about the world around you. So those were my. Yeah, what do you think those Margo's my background is? Based can on you tell Listen, I, I go through the scientific method with my four year old, so <laughs> every it's, day it's possible. I agree. It's possible. <laughs> I agree. It's the key to all. <laughs> problem solving, that is. Um, okay. um, I have problem solver. solving as my first skill. Um, emotional resilience. Uh, f um, I think another skill is um, to be able to speak a foreign language, to be critical thinkers or critical thinking as a skill. These are, I felt like there was like overlap between my number one and two, so I don't know where these best belong, but. Um, I think the business, oh, well, one, one thing, one experience that I think is really important is having some sort of work experience while in school. So um, whether it's internships or apprenticeships, I think that the business education partnership is very important. I know Maine does that really well. I don't think New Hampshire does it quite as well. But um, And then I would love for kids to maintain a genuine interest in learning as they go, as they become adults. Um, project-based learning, outdoor education, and more physical experience, not just phys ed, but um, more sort of like... Kinesthetic learning? Yes, thank you. Getting out and, and, and being more active at school rather than just sitting in a classroom all day. Um, and then um, being tech savvy, whatever that means at, at a given point in our... Culture. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I skip for right now? Because I want to. Uh, yep. Yep. Well, the first thing I had was uh, students need to know how to read and write. <laughs> you know how you hear they kids do. go to college. I'm not talking Portsmouth, but just all over the world. They go to college and they don't know how to read and write. So, particularly write. I think writing is a is a challenge. So, that was something that. I like to think our students do know how to do that by the time they graduate, but I'll just put that out there because it seems to be a worldly thing. Then I wrote down no AI. I'm not even sure I exactly understand what AI is. <laughs> it seems to it seems to be chat, coming, chat GPT. you know it seems to be coming a very challenging event Man. in our high, in our educational system. So. You know, or manage it. I guess maybe that would be a better way to say <laughs> it. Manage, AI. navigate it, whatever. Manage AI and other social media tactics that affect how our students learn. So um, maybe that's a better way of saying that. No AI is how I wrote it down. <laughs> I like the idea of a foreign language. I think um, many secondary schools, students do speak a, a foreign language by the time they graduate. That's not necessarily the case at our high school. It's obviously offered, and it's an excellent program. My own <laughs> child went through it. But um, foreign language, I think, is something that I know year after year we've tried to put it in our elementary schools, and it's a budget item that has been 
eliminated. Um, so foreign language, I think, would be great. I wrote down knowledge of world and U.S. history. You know when you watch Jimmy Fallon at night and they have that microphone and they say, who's the vice president of the United States? Or, you know, what is the First Amendment to the Constitution? And people absolutely have no idea. So it just makes me think, you know, if, if we could make sure that our kids have the basic understanding of our history and world history, um, I think that's important. Um, and then I love the, somebody mentioned it, the association we have with our business community, um, UNH, SN, SHNU, whatever it is, um, you know, these higher education, uh, Great Bay, where they can earn credits that can apply to their first year of college. That obviously is a money saver for families. So I think we, it would be great if we could expand on that. So those, those are just some of the few things I had. I mean, I had, you know, ability to think objectively, ability to sort out obstacles that get in the way, um, try your best, uh, be able to accept and deal with adversity. Hmm. So. Thank you. Exactly everything I had had been mentioned other than uh, the, the, the language and also traveling along with having some business hmm. experience, uh, doing some traveling to other countries and, and dealing with languages. Uh, project-based learning. Thank you. My turn. Um, uh, so I have a bit of an early childhood background, but I really like apply it across the board in my own life um, as far as um, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's starting to um, sort of go across the board uh, with using cognitive behavioral therapy for adults with substance use and whatnot. Um, but I think a big component of that and sort of that um, idea is um, looking towards the future and um, and like building towards the, the future. And so um, I do think that we're missing some things like, um, but at the same time, I think we do do it. Um, so I would say like child-led, um, um, child-led learning. Um, also portfolios, which is like a Reggio Emilia style, um, would go along with project-based learning. But the portfolios I found in high school, actually I did one, um, and I, I feel like it gives a lot of reflection. And actually it was probably the one class I remembered and obviously had something to take from it too. Um, and so basically building your learning within the, you know, more of a portfolio experience. Um, and then just like more exposure to, um, multiple experiences like real life experiences, community service type experiences, seeing things out in the real world. I know when I was in middle school in Portsmouth, um, everybody broke into groups and we went to different businesses downtown and you know, one of my friends, we went to an architecture firm and then he became an architect. But it didn't really strike a, a nerve for me, <laughs> but I wish I had more of that. Um, and then, um, so more like realistic experiences. And then um, to what Nancy said, I do think it's imperative and I think that there is a missing piece of like government and basic knowledge of like legal systems and your rights and what that looks like. Um, I know we have law day. Um, we sort of missed on that. The bar tries to do a little bit there, but um, I think there's more education around it. Um, and so I'd like to see a little more of that too. Great, thank you. Let's come back over here. All right, um, I'm gonna try not to repeat what everybody else has said, but I wanna echo the foreign language because I just think that it's so important to be a global citizen in reality and not just give lip service to which actually speak a language and also understand different cultures. Um, I think I'm just looking at some of my things that people haven't mentioned. And this is a little hard to articulate, but I mean, I'm a journalist and they teach you to parachute in anywhere. And I feel like I don't know what that means in education, but I think we should be graduating people that know how to show up anywhere in the world that they find themselves and just figure out what to do, figure out how to build relationships, figure out how to navigate a different culture, different country, different city or whatever. Um, I also feel like being physically and mentally healthy and knowing how to take care of their own physical and mental health, we could do a better job of supporting in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with making students tech savvy and perhaps develop better impulse control around all of that in some ways so they can better understand what impact that has on them in, in addition to how they use it. And I think that they should graduate knowing how to swim. My high school required that. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah, like, kids drown. Yeah, really and important. we live right by the water, and we don't require them to know how. And we so have a I'm going to the high school. toss that out there. 
Um, it used to be third grade curriculum. I know, yeah, but I <laughs> I'm just thinking about things others haven't said. Um, and I think just in terms of just all the information that comes at them all the time, making them have a more sticky attention span. <laughs> and I don't know how you do that, but giving them the ability to really dig into the things that matter to them and identify their own talents and strengths and to identify their own weaknesses so that they can get out into the world and like find the spot that fits them. And I think most of the rest of the things people have said. Great, thank you. Good. Um, this is very enlightening around the foreign languages because it gives me context for other conversations we've had. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think it, to me it's about foreign languages, but um, having the ability to adapt communication and having cultural curiosity. So like the ways to navigate a foreign place, whether it be North Carolina or, you know, um, Montreal or whatever it is. Um, uh, the ability to plan, so like more like that planning trips or travel, um, being able to set a goal and get to it. Um, also a big fan of the portfolio type base of that because I think those skills are, are part of um, some of those kind of capstone -y type experiences. Um, and then understanding basic health, bodily needs, and how to address by bodily needs. <laughs> Um, in healthy ways um, and then this one is oddly specific but being able to identify three uh, healthy coping strategies uh, for stress and adverse adversity and um, understanding overcoming uh, challenges trauma it was very nursing <laughs> I want to echo somebody said communication I think earlier maybe it was um, but I think that that the kind of communication you're talking about and then I think just communication in general is so critical and I think that we're um, you know whether it's in a foreign language or not but I think that is something in writing and in person I think I, I just think I wanted to I wanted to emphasize mm -hmm. that because I think that's so mm -hmm. crucial Could and I, I think it's on? getting lost in our world of you know te texting or speaking in three letter sentences especially during covid right yeah. like face to face communication was something that people weren't mm -hmm. practicing yeah that yeah. reminded me of one other thing i think the ability to disagree <laughs> and be around people who have different opinions <laughs> was something Agreed. that i was thinking about respectfully yeah. disagree yeah and i, I be disagree an active with listener. that lisa oh no we're <laughs> never gonna go but like <laughs> no just to be an active listener and to be able to like coexist with people who have different opinions. Yep. Yep. And have confidence in your own opinion. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. I'm Great gonna I'm gonna move us along. I I keep looking at the clock to make sure we have time for questions three and four as well. Um, any last I'm words sure. about number two before we move on? I was, I was just thinking as you're going, and I think overall everyone did a really great job, but it was also very challenging in the planning sessions to stick to like an assets oriented approach and like avoid some of those like kids these days need to not and like those things. And I think we all did a really good job of transitioning some of those things into like, no, this is what we want as opposed to like, we don't want. Thank you for pointing that out. So the next two questions go hand in hand. Um, this first one is around, you know, what are we currently doing well? What is Portsmouth School District doing to help students develop these characteristics, qualities, and goals? On the flip side, the last question is, you know, what could we be doing better? So um, I often have to remind people, kind of like what Carrie's saying, this one's very focused on the assets, what's already happening, what's going well, um, and then paired with that, this is almost like questions one and two together. So, you know, what are we currently doing well as far as developing these characteristics, but then also what are the experiences um, that we're providing that's helping to achieve these hopes and dreams? Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a big question. <clears throat> Are we comfortable starting on this side? Yeah, I can go first. Great. 
Um, so I think what we currently do that I think is are great that I think anybody across the board could utilize, whether they're going to med school or they want to be a nurse when they leave, is um, the CTE program and expanding on that. Um, the arts, I think our arts program really gets kids, you know, uh, percussion ensemble and just, you know, and just sort of traveling and competing and meeting other schools and, and um, just arts in general and culture in that way. Um, the clubs in school and allowing the clubs to take place during the school day. Um, and then as far as like thinking across like down, like I think, I feel like we're like, I mean, in my head I'm thinking, okay, what are the high schoolers doing? I don't really know a lot of what the high schoolers are doing because I don't have a high schooler and I probably should go to the high school more um, or sit in on, you know, on a, a day there. But, um, but at Don Darrow where my son goes, the elementary school, um, they have a beehive and they're using the beehive across the board. So the library is doing the beehive and they're able to sort of scaffold it and um, build on it and kind of create that um, that uh, portfolio or that uh, approach with, with the beehive. And so cross-curricularly. Um, yeah, and so expand. So if you're like interested in something, how else could you sort of engage with it? Um, so I think that's really great. Um, what I think we could do better as far as um, meeting that communication piece, my son came from the UNH Child Study Center which is a huge resource. Um, we help pass play-based kindergarten, but um, I felt, I mean, uh, I don't know you're coming on board, but um, my originally ran for school board because I was kind of ticked off because we helped pass play-based kindergarten and then it wasn't implemented. And um, they offered all these trainings and there are components of kindergarten right now, but the big piece of UNH that I really wish that we would take on is, is the ability for, um, uh, basically having teachers engage in play spaces um, at, at recess on the playground I feel like there's so many missed opportunities there so I want to pause yeah because this feels like it's a part lot. of question four okay oh question. I thought we were doing both together no Just oh, okay. focusing on what we're doing well right now okay sorry but, sorry but I, I, I love going. I love where yeah, you're going with okay. play base in kindergarten can you yeah. hold on to that for question four yeah so I think as far as I think that's really as far as what we're doing well I think from a high school perspective I think it's CTE arts clubs and schools and the opportunities we're really offering kids um, I also think you know allowing our teachers to kind of have some reins to build it um, to you know see what UNH is doing and kind of in, have those college classes and, and whatnot and then as far as the ele elementary is um, the beehives and as far as middle school I think middle school I think you know I really wish that every school would be like the middle school where they meet the kids at the door mm -hmm. and they see how they're doing they have their it starts a day in a positive way keeps an eye on everybody and I, I think it really helps build that sense of community so I think they really do that well great thank you thanks sorry it's okay hold that thought because I want to hear more uh, I, I would say that what we're doing really well is we're offering so much is actually something for everybody no matter what their wishes are and if they want to add something they can do that too like like with some of the uh, extracurricular uh, type of thing I remember they, they were doing something a frisbee for somebody so they started a club um, they have so many different experiences CTE gives them experiences uh, they have uh, uh, ways of doing traveling uh, groups with, with language uh, I think at all levels. I, I think at the middle school, uh, while they're working in teams, that's that's a very productive kind of thing that's really, really working well. So I would say that's, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Um, I wrote down a wide variety of academic course selections, um, which people have talked about um, extracurricular activities that allow students to grow and develop, athletics, arts, academics. Um, I think our PLC, the, the strategy we have with our PLCs is, is very good because it allows our teachers to have one-on-one um, -on -one with students um, as they go through the K through 12. Um, it's valuable. They didn't have that when my kids were here and it you know puts the attention on individual students and what their needs are and um, how we can help make that student achieve what they need to achieve. So I, I'm, I think that's admirable for us. A special ed program, which I have had direct contact with, is excellent and has always had an incredibly um, great reputation in the seacoast in the state. Um, uh, and I, that's what I had. Thank you. Um, I think um, 
just to add, I'm not sure I understand PLCs because I thought they were something different, but maybe we could go back to that another day. Um, I think on an elementary side, I think social emotional learning is a big strength. Um, and also, you know, work to have community events and community engagement at the schools in addition to all the other things. <clears throat> um, I, like Liz, had CTE first. Um, I think that that department offers some really great um, learning with real of real world skills, um, and I wish that we could expand that and offer it to more more kids. Um, I think our our as she already has said, and other people echoed that. I think the arts, especially the performing arts, is very strong. The clubs are strong. Or the uh, extracurricular offerings and the athletics um, and I think some of what we some of the minimal programs that we have in, in project-based learning like the, the gardening pre, you know stuff at the, at the elementaries and um, the, certainly the stuff that Lister Academy does is really excellent and again I'd love to see those expanded but I know that's question four. <laughs> um, Yes, I had a lot of that. What did I have that was different? Um, strong community support of our events. Success block at the middle school. Small teacher to student ratio. Yeah. And um, Lister Academy. The ability to, what I mean by that is that, that the ability that we can it's so rare for a district to be able to offer a non-traditional high school to seek out a need that we knew we had and that we can meet, back to what Ann was saying, that we, we can offer a diverse array so that everybody gets something. I think that is a, a great model. In question four, I'll talk about <laughs> how we could be doing that for all of our students. <laughs> I think one thing that nobody has said that was on my list was just our teachers. I mean, we have teachers with a mm -hmm. huge amount of experience, and we've yeah. always done a great job of letting Good them, one. you know, pursue innovation and passion projects across the district. And I have some question four ideas around that too, but I do think that that's a real strength. Mm -hmm. um, I love some of the partnerships that we've built just between the buildings, like for example, that Lister does the Sugar Shack with the elementary schools, and so there's a lot of ways that we're allowing our older students to be leaders and mentors and for our younger students to have that experience with where they could go with the things they're learning and I think that's wonderful. I think we have pockets of really great use of capstone projects and weirdly I see it more in the elementary school than the high school but that may be that I just don't have the visibility around it. Um, and I also think that particularly with you know the performing arts we really do have strong programming. Um, and I like the variety of classes that students have that have been really responsive over the years to changes in the things that students are curious about and they want to learn about. So I think everything else has been said, so I don't want to repeat. <laughs> Anything new or different that people want to add before we move on to question four? It occurs to me, are we hearing from our people who are on Zoom? No, we don't have people on Zoom. Oh, so they don't. You're not hearing the, from them. No. I'm going to set up a separate, uh, like a separate subgroup for, oh, for the members that weren't here tonight. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to add um, uh, the fifth grade um, environmental camp. I can't, it came up, I feel like, yesterday or something. It like guided somebody's whole career or something like that. Um, no, not whole career. Actually, it came up with my girlfriend who's a travel nurse and she hikes and does all this. And she said environmental camp is really what got her going in yeah. fifth grade. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's sort of unique in that way, but um, that's definitely a, a good experience that the kids have. Maple syrup. The maple syrup project in third <laughs> yeah. grade. Yep. In the four, well, fourth grade, they do, um, I think it's Common Core now, but they do um, all of the national parks. Um, so they start kind of getting engaged in that too. That's cool. um, Okay, so we're going to transition now to question four. This is our last question. Um, in what ways or with what experiences do you think Portsmouth School District could better prepare students for life after high school? Um, can we start on this side? Sure. Um, 
So I feel like there's almost a flip side to some of the things that are our strengths. Like, for example, we have excellent language instruction at the high school, but it's not consistent all the way through. And I think that giving kids an intentional build in the curriculum all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade so that, you know, what we decide is our priority stays with them all the way through. I don't think we have that across the board right now. Um, and I think, for example, while we're excellent in the performing arts and in languages, we don't value those in the way that we do our scheduling. We call them electives. We don't value them in terms of how we weight our grades. We don't give that the same weight as we consider quote unquote academic classes. So I think there's some inconsistencies between where we're excellent in what we offer kids and how we value those in the scheduling and the grading. Um, I think that um, we're not as good as we could be at making sure that all of our kids can see themselves in the curriculum. And, and I don't know that I have a specific example, but I just think like across the boards, like we could have more diverse things in our libraries. We could have more diverse options in the way that we offer kids projects and what we let them pick to do, how we let them talk about their lives. And we're getting better, but I still think we have a way to go there. Um, and I also think that the flip side of the teachers really being able to innovate and have really great passion projects is that these things aren't always consistently implemented. So we don't have equitable access across the buildings or even from one class to the next within a grade in terms of how kids are able to benefit from these really wonderful things that are bubbling up. And so I'd love to see us figure out how to prioritize innovation and then implement it in a consistent way so that the, the things that we value that, we, that are really great are equally available to all of our kids. And I think those are the big things to me. And I think I'd also like to see like a better map so that parents and students can understand like where they're supposed to go. Because <laughs> we do have so much variety, but I think navigating that is not always clearly articulated. Mm. I think that's my big stuff. Thank you. I don't know. So going to me next. My notes got really <laughs> sloppy towards this part of the, um, I wrote uh, capstone projects at the culmination of each school, like elementary would be in fifth, eighth, twelfth, um, an intentional and thoughtful community service K through 12. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, we have a sister school in Japan and their curriculum is K through five is service in schools six or eight is service in your community and then nine through twelfth is service in your state and global mm. um, that's consistent with a lot of schools and i i think mm. that model strikes on so many of the things we've talked about wanting our kids to have and i think service is often overlooked as an add-on and i think there's some great data that supports it's a it builds some confidence in all of our students who may not have had that opportunity to thrive um, I would love to see um, a, a STEAM curriculum that's consistent and intentional and at each level. Right now we have pockets of it, but it creates an equity issue. Um, a, a, an engaging play-based elementary. Um, what did I write? Um, oh. This might be, well, um, I feel like one of the things we're not meeting is that we have pockets of kids we pay attention to, and then there's boys and active kids that I don't think our schools <coughs> are preparing well. I, I, I think they are mislabeled, not properly grown, and I, I there's some great studies when we were in New York that the middle school, they separate based on the grade, they separate certain classes by sex. So, so math and science, you might only have as boys versus girls. And I think the ability to be nimble and respond to certain things, nimble would be a big piece that I'd have. I think there's the Portsmouth way. We aren't very nimble. <laughs> and um, I would love to see us incorporate that more into our programming of that. I had the K through 12 language and then I, in terms of ninth grade I, I would and I think we've talked on this on tech savvy but I think it goes deeper in that um, it concerns me greatly that these kids have a digital signature right and everything they do is recorded and, and at, a, at a maturity level for which they can't really comprehend it so 
I think our role is to teach them how do you properly blog? How do you publicly speak? How do you, what does it mean to have a code of ethics and how do you defend that? I think there's a responsibility that we have to take knowing that those things are gonna be out there. Mm -hmm. Not just teaching them what the, the sources are, but how to live in a world successfully with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I also had uh, a note about starting foreign languages <laughs> early. Um, I think that's really critical and and um, to that end similarly having more cohesion all the way through in everything um, you know with a real really strong K through 12 plan because I know we've talked about things being sort of siloed in the at the different age ranges um, uh, similarly I think that we could be stronger in our in our athletic offerings at younger ages um, I think we've ended up in a place in our society where it's very, where there is, there's a lot of inequity because we don't have a lot of offerings um, at a young age, so people have to do private sports and clubs, um, and so that doesn't, fair, that doesn't prepare our students in a fair way for, for as they get older, coming into our very strong athletic program in the high school. Um, basic life skills training I think we could be stronger at. Uh, a big one for me is the attention to mental health, um, the anxiety rates, in, particularly in the high school, but I know in the middle school and even in the elementaries are extremely high. And I know too many kids who are falling through the cracks and not um, succeeding because of that. Uh, and then, um, to that end as well, I have to disagree with Nancy and say I think our special ed department is is not as strong as it should be and um, particularly in identifying kids early enough um, and, and anecdotally I, I've just heard a lot of uh, feedback that it's not, it's not doing what it needs to do for many of the kids, particularly the boys as you mentioned. Um, I think what we could do better is engagement of all students and belonging um, and, and in clubs and navigating that, really understanding what the what some of the barriers are. Um, my impression is that multiple opportunities are utilized by a small group of students. So we may have 10 clubs, but one student is in six of them. Um, and then we're not necessarily capturing those that don't have that um, or aren't in that opportunity. I think there's a great opportunity to, for more recognition in our community and in our schools that we have diverse experiences within our community. Um, and I think that navigating how to do that well and without, you know, um, you know, asking folks to share, but just understanding of, you know, how, yeah. I don't, understanding poverty, really, it's really about poverty and and opportunity and things like that. Um, and then I'm just I'm stuck on the language thing, so I just have to like you know say one thing is like I I don't I, I, and maybe modern like lang maybe language instruction has changed a lot, but I think what I'm hearing so much is the importance of cultural competency, um, and I think that I don't always think uh, languages communicate that. I think languages often communicate verb conjugations mm -hmm. and exams and things like that. So I think maybe if we're doing something like that, making sure that it's matching the role we want it to play in the school. Thank you for saying that. that. Okay. Um, I had expand CTE, STEM, I worked on plumbing, electrical. You know, we all hear our plumbers and electricians tell us when they retire, there's nobody to take their job. So I don't. I don't know if we would have the demand for that, so that's something that we would have to um, explore, but to expand that to include the trades and um, uh, um, that kind of thing. I had more social work as mental health professionals to help students, particularly since COVID. We've seen an uprise in that, and I know we've talked about it on our board. I, ha I wrote down that I think, and this is something that it would be administrative role, I think we need to examine our organizational chart and see if there are some positions that maybe could be, I don't wanna say eliminated, but re, restructured. Um, you know, I'm not sure, 
and you would know that better than anybody else. So, I mean, as, especially as you're getting to learn our school district, but is there um, a way we can restructure our organizational chart to make it more efficient and more cost effective, I guess, too, looking at it from a budget standpoint. Um, I wrote down safety, school safety. We're dealing with that now. I know Zach is working hard on trying to figure out what we should do as a school district to make our schools safer. He's going to have a little report tonight. But, um, you know, that's something that's going to be on the radar screen for a long time is school safety and what we can do to make our schools as safe as they possibly can be. Um, one thing I've always felt, um, guidance counselors. We have four guidance counselors for four grades. So each guidance counselor has two, 250 to 300. When my son graduated, there were 320 kids in his class. I know they're not that big now. but. Um, I, we probably could use a few more guidance counselors. You know, that's a big student load for one guidance counselor. So that's a B I've always had in my bonnet. Um, oh, early childhood. You know, we had an employee once that worked with the students from three to six year olds so that we knew they were coming into our system and they were, that they might require special ed services or we had a, um, what do you call it? You know, we would Native. screen the kids. Yeah, and we screened those kids. So we knew that they, now that job got eliminated, unfortunately, a few years ago. So if we could put the emphasis, and that would help our special ed, that if we could identify children when they're three to six and they're coming into our school district, um, that could help us uh, identify those kids and learn what we have to do to um, accommodate them. Time check, it is seven o'clock. Me, can we finish with our last two? I'll make Is this it a, really quick. Okay. <laughs> Many of the things that they have said I would agree with. Uh, community service, I think, is important, mm. and then for students to understand what it means to be a responsible citizen <coughs> and, uh, and, and more guidance and, and social workers. And, and being sure that, that every child in every building has a go-to person in that building. Mm. I'll skip the rest. Um, so I guess I'll circle back to the um, play-based kindergarten. Um, I really think that um, the playground should be used as learning spaces just as well as the classroom um, in, in really having a focus on um, having the youngest grades, the, the PEEP program in kindergarten and, and even first grade, really focusing on um, not only the, uh, the um, social emotional learning aspect, but using those play spaces to navigate um, if possible. Um, Additionally, uh, I guess the way that the schools address bullying, like my kid didn't know what a bully was until, you know, they put the word in his mouth and then it was kind of like if my kid, you know, so I think it's it's how the younger grades are addressing communication between small children and the words that are being used and I think that would go a really long way. Um, you know, I, I think my son is socially advanced because of his UNH education. So I really would like to utilize UNH more in the research and the, in the best practices that they're seeing for the younger grades. I do think that we um, need to have more of a focus on substance use, substance misuse, um, and mental health, um, you know, and having more late acts, having more substance misuse education, um, because the reality is, is, you know, kids are going to college and they're drinking um, and then using substances and whatnot. So how do we um, address that and educate them in, in best practices? I'm not exactly sure what we do now, but I know that I think we're short on the LADAC front. Um, tech learning, um, I agree with that. I think, you know, having that um, background, um, meeting community needs, figuring out what the needs are in the community, like Nancy said, plumbing and, and whatnot. But um, I think, you know, we need nurses and, you know, there, I think there's other, you know, companies that may like, you know, would LabCorp or, you know, not LabCorp, would uh, some of these bigger science companies that, that are in town, would they hire um, and, you know, could we sort of funnel kids there? Um, with that being said, I also think that there's real life housing issues in this area and the cost of mm -hmm. living is really um, astronomical. So for a kid to get out of high school and not have a plan or not know where they're going or or, or whatnot, I think that um, having those like real life conversations and, and you know, having a roommate and like having a budget and doing all that, I, I don't know exactly what we do now, but I do feel like um, that needs, there needs to be a focus there, um, tech and STEM. And so I think that's probably, and also just um, I, to reiterate what, what Pip said about special education, I had somebody phrase it that there's other schools um, in the area that will say, you know, when a kid comes in, what do you need? And they meet the kid's needs. And Portsmouth tends to put up, it's not like, what do you need? 
when you walk in. It's like, do you really need that sort of thing? <laughs> and I understand it from a budget point, and I understand that, but I think if we were able to attack, like, not attack, but if we were able to get on these kids when they're younger, you know, it'd be less, maybe less expense later. Um, but also, I think, you know, a lot of these kids aren't being addressed when they're younger, so then when they're you know, older boys, middle school, high school, the behavior problems kick in, then we're having to pay for them to go out of district. Needless to say, we're going to get kids from out of district anyways that we may have to deal with in that regard. But um, uh, basically, you know, trauma education and um, and really just that mental health focus piece because, it, I mean, the reality is, is we're in a huge mental health crisis. So. I wanted to just add to that that accommodating, before we even get to special ed, just accommodating uh, different learning or learning differences, I think, is, yes. like, really critical. Mm -hmm. And I and think that could save us. Yeah, I think, I think the, with know, COVID, I think into. that we've started to do a little bit better with that. But, yeah, I mean, like, those modifications within the classroom and movement and, and whatnot. And I, I know it can be a chaotic, but... Um, uh, and we, across the board, don't make our activities... Of accessible to our students who have different abilities Learning styles and, like yeah. the clubs are not accessible like many things are overstimulating too loud like not physically possible for kids to do and we just don't include them you know and a lot of other school districts do a better job I think also of outreaching to parents <laughs> like did I forget to say we don't communicate well with the people who raise the children in our district <laughs> I think that's an important piece to sort of end on this Sorry. idea of <laughs> caregiver <laughs> family <laughs> communication and that being like a major focus. That's a good sorry. piece to end on. No, nope. don't be sorry. Any last words before? What is the next step from for us as the school board in this process? Or I think you've maybe laid so, it out in the agenda. I mean, the next step for for us for the committee is to collect all of this data and synthesize it and the next step for you will be to sort of take a look at all of the bucketed themes that we come up with and see if it's aligned with the vision that you've shared are you doing any specific outreach to families with kids in special ed because that has not been done in this district yes. in like years yes not in so, the whole time I've had a kid in special ed so here. what we're doing with the survey is we're um, we're asking an initial question around race and ethnicity, around um, a language other than English spoken at home, and special ed status. Oh, okay. So that we can then take that data and um, sort of disaggregate it in that way and okay. sort of make sure that we're prioritizing historically marginalized voices, special ed being in that bucket. No, sure, that's and just that's a survey piece. that goes to everybody? That survey is going to go to literally everybody. Right. We're going to spread it as widely as we can. It's going, <laughs> it's, we're going to have them take it in middle school, take it in the high school. We're going to send it to families. We're going to put it on social media. Everybody can fill out the survey. And it's going to be released as soon Gosh. as the focus groups end. So that's May 15th. Because this is the outside. What we want to do is look at what we got out of focus groups, and is there any tweaking we want to do with questions as a result of what we got out of focus groups? And we might even, based on focus groups, we like to create a list for people to choose from because we find if you send out a survey without any kind of, it's just like, hey, what are your hopes and dreams? You just get the weirdest answers, like the doctor and lawyer answers that aren't yeah. actually all that helpful. So giving people choices based on what we're hearing in the focus groups, the survey is going to be developed you know, based on that. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank very you. Thank you. you. Yes. And we hey, will move on to our, our non-public, which is in the boardroom. Yeah. So oh. if everybody can yeah. come into the boardroom. That would